Good luck. Thank you. Um, I'm going to start out with talking about something that, that, that you probably all can relate to, given that you just had lunch. And that is, if you walked into my apartment, you'd notice one thing, and that is that I own a lot of cookbooks. So I, I'm very interested in cooking, but I'm a really bad chef. No, what that has learned, that what that has taught me is that when you read these cooking books, you know, you follow the recipe, there is always something missing on the page that uh, is quite uh, vital to turning it into a really good dish. Now, what I've come to realize sometimes when we talk about value investing is that there are certain parts of value investing they're very good at describing, and there are other parts that we, for a variety of reasons, don't focus so much on. So what I thought I'd do today is to spend a bit of time on some of those elements that we generally don't talk so much about, but that we still find to be pretty important to our investment performance. Now, as uh, most of you here know, we are value investors, and the origins of value investing goes all the back to the late 1920s, early 1930s, which ben with Benjamin Graham and David Dodd. They wrote a pretty revolutionary book at the time called Security Analysis. Today, the concepts of the book are pretty mainstream in a way, as what they told investors was that when you buy a stock, you actually buy a claim to a company's income and assets. And they also said something that we think are some of the most important words ever spoken about investing, and that is that investing is most intelligently done when it's the most businesslike. As value investing has evolved, you know, uh, the hallmark of a value investor has become that it tends to focus on stocks that are on, undervalued, obviously, and that tends to materialize itself in low multiples. So value investors tend to seek out stocks that trade on low price to book multiples and low PE multiples. Now, looking at companies in that frame of mind creates what we think is a very interesting practical problem. And that is that companies are not static like multiples. They're more like organisms. They evolve over time. So by effectively freezing the company at a certain point in time and disregarding effectively what's going to happen in the future, you run the risk of missing out at something that's really important, and that's that companies change over time, they create value over time. And for us, who are not only value investors, but we're also long-term investors, this becomes pretty important. So, whereas value investing typically is a bit like when you go to a lumber yard and you try to value all the wood that sits in the yard, and you can see how big and long the, 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 the trees are, you know, value investing to us is more like buying a forest. You get the trees and you value them, but you also have to realize that these things change over time for a variety of reasons. And that's why, you know, oftentimes we talk about value investing being like buying a dollar for 50 cents. In reality, I think it's more like we're picking money off trees. And a really good value investing is more like buying the entire tree when it's really small, you plant it inside your portfolio, and you let it sit there and grow and create value for a very long period of time. So Charlie Munger, the, the sidekick of Warren Buffett, once said that the only thing he really ever wanted to know was where it was going to die. And if you think about it, there is some important insights into how to invest in that quote, and that is if you start out knowing how to lose money, it makes it an awful lot easier to make money. And, and just like uh, the books that I read about cooking that don't really describe how to destroy food, value investors very seldomly talk about how they lose money. Now, before we get into a bit more detail, I think it's important to make a very critical distinction, and that is between what I call a temporary loss of capital and a permanent loss of capital. A temporary loss of capital is basically what you see in the markets every day when stocks move up and down, and the temporary loss of capital is there not because the fundamentals of the business has really changed, but because people in the markets decide to price it slightly differently. It's really painful when stock prices go down, but it doesn't necessarily link to the fundamental value of the company. To us, the really scary part uh, of losing money is what we call a permanent loss of capital. Permanent ca loss of capital comes in a few different forms, and I mean, you can, you, I'll, I'll describe two of them in a bit more detail, but uh, if we want to think about the really simple example, a loss of patent would destroy the value of a company, obviously, and the same would, you know, a value-destructive acquisition. No, 
to me at least, a change in the economic environment is not necessarily a permanent loss of capital. The reason being that as a prudent investor, that's something you should have thought about before you bought the company. So in your analysis of the value of the company, this is something that you should already have put into your numbers. So in effect, this is something that should already be expected on your hand. But still, there are two really important killers of value investors in terms of losing capital. I'll start with the first one, and that is debt. Uh, a couple of years back, I had the privilege of having lunch with Anthony Bolton, who some of you might know. He's one of the really great investors in Europe. And I asked him, so Mr. Bolton, what's been kind of the, 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 the common feature of most of the times that you've lost a lot of money on your investments? And he answered very quickly, all those investments have involved, all those companies have involved uh, debt at some level that has caused things to go very wrong. And that, from our point of view, is a difficult thing to deal with, and it's something you have to be very careful with as an investor. There are a couple of reasons for that. Firstly, if a company has a lot of debt, it reduces its operational flexibility. When things change in their environment, they have less, less flexibility to act in the best possible way. The other thing is that it increases risk and uncertainty. On one level, this could be that if a company has a lot of debt, interest rate risk becomes a lot more important. And we're not very good economists, so for us, those type of things are very difficult to predict accurately in the long run. The other problem with risk is that, in, like in most other areas of life, there is some sort of Murphy's Law applying. Typically, when things go wrong with the company, it's not only one thing going wrong. Multiple things tend to go wrong at the wrong time. And that's when companies get into distress and either have to raise equity or debt. Sorry, either have to raise uh, capital or potentially go bankrupt. And obviously, as all of us capitalists would know, it's very hard to recover from bankruptcy. You need a lot of percent. Not any percentage number in the world can make you recover from zero. The last thing that you want to think about before you venture into companies with a lot of debt is that in our experience, companies that are really good, they usually don't need a lot of debt to operate. If a company needs a lot of debt to be successful, you should stop, take a step back, and think about whether this is really, really a good company in the way you thought it would be. Now, there is another killer and he's a bit more silent. And the origin of this killer actually goes back to Karl Marx, who coined the term creative destruction. Now, this term was later adopted by Americans, most famously by Joseph Schumpeter, who commercialized it and made it popular. But the essence of what Marx talked about, and that was later uh, converted by Schumpeter, is very interesting. What he talks about is how companies fight each other for profits, and they do that through innovation, cutting costs, and so on. And that means that if you have a profit pool in your business, people are going to attack it and try to steal it from you. And it's going to shrink unless you're able to move around and protect it. So why is this particularly relevant for value investors? Well, in our experience, companies that are about to hit creative destruction tend to look very cheap on the surface. Multiples have typically come down, and so on. They trade on low multiples. If you want an example, think about the Canadian owner of BlackBerry, Rim. The multiples look extremely good, but creative destruction is unfolding in front of this company. You have Apple and all these other players attacking their playing ground, and that's why the future prospects of that company is probably highly uncertain. It's very difficult to get very academic when you describe creative destruction because it's a very fluffy concept. But I think one good indicator of how this works, you can find if you go back to 1896 when the Dow Jones Industrial Index was founded and you know they put together 12 of the great American companies back then. Now what's very interesting about that list is that there is probably maybe only one or two names on that list you can recognize. The rest of them has pretty much disappeared, and the only one that's still standing strong is General Electric. That's creative destruction at work. Even in an economy like the US one that's been growing tremendously over that period of time, companies have disappeared because they've been competed away by their fellow capitalists. Now, the next thing I'm going to talk about is a topic that's very complicated for value investors. And it's a, it's, it's a good thing, but it's also a bad thing. And I, so I'm going to do like my dad when he wanted to introduce me to the things that are kind of good, but also bad, you know, girl girls, alcohol, and driving. I'm going to start with a very long warning. 
And the first thing that you need to keep in mind when you start looking at growth is the academic aspect of this. If you look at all the studies that cover growth and look at how it uh, impacts investments, they pretty much all say the same thing, and that is that it's extremely dangerous. You know, the, co the most common studies tell you that high PE stocks tend to underperform low PE stocks, and the study I'm referring to here is one that tells you that the companies with the highest expected growth um, according to the analysts, tend to underperform the stocks with the lowest expected growth as seen by the analyst. And as you can see, it's by 2.8 percentage points a year, and over a long period of time, that adds up to an awful lot of money. Now, beyond the academic challenges of growth, which we are keenly aware of, there are a few practical challenges as well. The first one is that growth is pretty popular because it's moving and you know, like anything that, mo at, that moves, it attracts the interest of investors in Wall Street and everyone else who wants to make money. And areas that are pretty popular, they tend to become very expensive and as such you have to walk very carefully into these areas to be, uh, and be aware that you're not getting tricked into believing in other people's ideas rather than your own. The other thing about growth that I think is very important to keep in mind is that growth does not always equal value creation. Even if a company is in a growing industry, it doesn't mean that you're going to get rich from owning it. The most classical example of this would be the airline industry. I mean, airlines have been around for a long time. The industry has grown pretty large, but for the poor capitalists owning the stock, the stocks, it's been a pretty big disaster. No investor on aggregate has ever made any money owning airline stocks. And that's just one example. Another example, a bit closer to home, would be something like the windmill industry. So you take a Vesta. So if you go, the Vesta share price is now basically back to where it was in the early 2000s. When I look around Denmark, Norway, and other parts of the world, I see more windmills now than I did in 2002. Now the problem is that the growth has caused new people to enter the market and the profitability that was once there has more or less disappeared or at least it's become a lot more difficult to capture for investors. The last thing that you want to keep in mind when you start venturing into the world of growth is that growth is, is inherently hard to predict. It's a bit like when you drive your car really fast. There are more things that you have to be aware of happening in order to make it work. And that's the same with companies. Companies that grow very fast face a few obstacles that are very easy to ignore. And it's also very easy for us as, as investors to be blinded by the numbers and not go into the details and see how th things really work on an operational level. Despite all this, we still love growth. We love EPS growth. We like that companies grow. And I'll give you a very good example of why this actually is something that's pretty meaningful when you have companies that grow in your portfolio. An investment that's been with Skagen for a very, very long time is Samsung Electronics. Now, if you look at the performance of Samsung Electronics the last 10 years, you'll notice something that I think is pretty nice, and that is that the share price has gone up 21% each year. So we've had a 21% annual compound return on our investment. Now, if you dive one level deeper, you'll uh, see something that we find also quite interesting, and that is that earnings growth has contributed a disproportionate part of that um, share price appreciation. So the company has been able to grow its earnings, and the share price has followed. Now, Samsung, when we bought it, was obviously cheap, and it remains cheap today, and as you can see, Multiple expansion, i.e. the PE of the company increasing from 6 to around 8 today, has only contributed 3%. That's about the same as the dividend we've received. And few people thought about that when we initially bought the company. And it's quite interesting when you go back and you look at the old notes about what we thought would happen to this company. Most of the things we wrote was wrong. We were wrong about a lot of things, but we've got one important thing right about Samsung, that, and that's really what has turned it into an excellent investment. That is, they were good at creating value in their company, and it so happened to be cheap, so we got to go along on the ride. And that brings us to a few pretty important points when we start analyzing the good things about growth, and that is that growth compounds. If something compounds 20% each year, or 10% each year, you get to pretty big numbers very quickly. Now, if you buy a stock because you think the multiples are going to ex expand and disregard the fact that cr the company has to uh, create value in the meantime, 
you know, you're going to get a one-off. You're going to have to wait, and then maybe the price book is going to go from 1.1 to 1.3, but it doesn't compound. It only happens once. And that brings me to the next point, and that is when things are growing and creating value while you wait for good things to happen to the multiples, you get paid to wait. If the company is static and doesn't really manage to create value in the meantime, you're getting, you're, you, you know, your value, your, your investment performance is suffering as you wait. There is a big difference if it takes the market five years to recognize that this company was cheap versus 10 years if no value is created by the company in the meantime. Another thing that I find very interesting, and I, 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 I spend quite a bit of time looking inside these financial models of companies, and I also like to look at what analysts put into their financial models when they, when they try to figure out what's going to happen in the future. Now, when I do that, I see something that I find to be quite interesting. And that is that the analysts spend an awful lot of time trying to figure out what's going to happen to the company over the next couple of years, but then when it comes to the real value dri driver, which is essentially the company's ability to generate value five, ten years from now, they simply plug in a number. And generally, that's a number that I don't know where they take it from, but that number tends to be very similar whether they analyze a steel company or a company like Nestle. And obviously, that's why analysts tend to underestimate the long-term growth dynamics of certain companies quite dramatically. And that's why companies like in Nestle and a Johnson & Johnson tend to become very good investments in the long run because they've been able to maintain a healthy growth and analysts tend to ignore the growth that happens beyond year five. Growth has a close relative. And it's a very important relative, I'll almost call it a sibling, and that's return on equity. Now, return on equity is essentially the return that the company gives back to us uh, when it deploys our capital to make products and services. You can, in a way, think about it as a bond or perhaps a savings account. But you know, when you buy companies on, uh, on price book two or three or maybe one and a half, people tend to forget about this, even though it's pretty important, because what you also get, apart from the uh, return on the existing capital in the company, is you get something that's even nicer, and that's the company's ability to deploy capital in the future at a very high rate of return. So if we were to think about it as a savings account, you're able to deposit more money into this company, and it can still continue to earn you a very high rate of return. And that's why I think this is one of the most interesting things that I've seen Buffett say ever, and that's that if you leave price aside, the best businesses to own are the ones that can deploy a large amount of capital, large amounts of incremental capital at very high rates of return. Now, this even gets a touch more interesting if you take a very, very long-term perspective, because what you'll find then is that it's very difficult for a stock's return in the very long term. In, in the very long term, it's very difficult for the return on a stock to exceed the company's return on capital. If we bring it back to the savings account example, it makes a lot of sense. It's very difficult for your savings account where you keep on depositing money to give you a higher return than the actual interest rate on that account. And the return on equity that the company gets on its in incremental capital is more or less the same thing. I'm not much of a top-down type of person, but sometimes top-down analysis can be used to illustrate some interesting points. And to most value investors, Japan is a pretty familiar story. It's been cheap for a very long time. In fact, as long as I can remember, I got involved in equities in the 2000s. And, you know, for value investors, it's therefore always been a, a very attractive place to go. People have told me that, well, you know, it's cheap on price book. Well, Korea is a bit of a similar story. It has also always been pretty cheap on price book. But there is, among, other, among uh, the differences between the two countries, there is one that's reasonably important for equity investors. And that's that Korea 
over the last 10 years have been able to achieve a substantially higher, Korean companies on an aggregate level have been able to achieve a substantially higher return on their equity. So whatever money you've deposited with Kore the Korean bank has earned you a substantially higher rate of return than what you got in Japan. Now some of this can obviously be explained by differences in interest rate levels, but as you can see, the order of magnitude here, 800 basis points, goes a far way in explaining why Korean equities has been a lot better to value investors than the Japanese ones. Now, one of the more interesting things that I oftentimes come across in, in when you talk to other you know, numbers-driven, dedicated value investors is that they tell you that Management doesn't matter at all. And I find that to be a very interesting paradox in our industry because the same people will then turn around, go in front of an audience, and tell the audience that I, as a portfolio manager, I can really make a difference allocating your capital between different things. And then they look to the companies and they claim that managers as companies don't have the same effect on the companies they manage. To me, that is very strange. And I think our experience over time is that managements do indeed matter. No, we are not the type of people who want to buy rock star management in our companies and pay a premium for that just because they're good. But in the long run, having good people look after your capital is better than having bad people look after your capital. No, in our world, and we're pretty simple people, you can see, say that it, on the extreme, you know, managers typically create value in, in, on, on, on two, in two extreme ways. One is the operational value creators. I'd say that's what we really like about the Korean companies. They're very good about making money, growing their businesses, allocating capital efficiently to uh, create even more growth. And then you can always debate the fact that they tend to pay a bit less dividend than we would have liked. But nevertheless, they've done a tremendous good job in the long run for looking after our capital. Other examples of this that we tend to like is Mahindra in India and Oracle in the United States. No, at the other end of the axis, you have the guys who are also good operators, but their edge seem to be that they're good financial value creators. So what do I mean by that? They seem to understand how markets work and how to operate eff efficiently as capital allocators between themselves and their investors. You know, they're willing to pay out money, they're willing to keep a healthy balance sheet. They don't, they're not necessarily like these guys who want to keep a lot of cash. They'll say, I'll run cash neutral with perhaps a little bit of debt, and I'll pay you guys a dividend. Now, those guys are equally interesting, but I must say, on, on average, it's typically in this area you find a lot of interesting, in, the most interesting investment, investments, simply because these guys tend to get loved by the market pretty quickly. Now, that being said, and if any of you have studied the Skagen portfolio, you probably observed one thing, and that is that you know, not all the companies that we own in Skagen have the world's best management. And that's entirely true. But we are very conscious of the fact that when we buy companies with management that we don't think are the best, that we think there is a reason for why it's going to change in the future, i.e. the value that's currently trapped inside the company because the management may not be doing the best thing they can with their assets, is somehow going to be unlocked by someone new coming into the company and offering a bit of new advice and inspiration. Now, it's, 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 it's very hard to create a very good laboratory for how this works in real life. And, uh, but I'll try to give you one example. And, uh, you know, I come from Stavanger, and it's always nice to choose something that's close to home, so I picked the oil industry. Sea drill and Pride are two oil drillers, uh, are two oil drillers. So they operate these big rigs that you take into the sea, you drill a hole in the ground, and if you're lucky, you find oil, and if you're not lucky, you just spent a lot of money on nothing. No. See, uh, Pride is an American company, it's based in Texas, and, and uh, you know, it's, uh, it, when we bought it, it was an okay company, we knew the management was not the best, and it was trading at a pretty healthy multiple. It was 2.2 times book, but we saw in the future that, that, there was, that there was a lot of value to be created in the industry. I think it's fair to say that the seed drill management, e even as we knew them then, were more no, sorry, the pride management, even as we knew them then, was more focused on protecting their own interests. They were more interested in protecting their jobs, cashing in their options, and doing the things that was needed to make them rich and not the shareholders.
Seadrill, on the other hand, came from a different angle. It was founded by a Norwegian shipping tycoon named John Fredriksen. And as we've gotten to know Mr. Fredriksen over the year, he's always been a guy that's been interested in making himself rich, but he's also been very conscious of the fact of making his shareholders rich. So when he started Seadrill, he told investors, look, I'll treat you fairly. When we have too much capital, I will pay it out. But if we need capital for whatever reason, i.e. because the market has changed, or because we want to make a value accretive acquisition, you guys join me and put in more money. It is kind of the best kind of way I've ever seen this type of company managed. He viewed his relationship with shareholders as more of a partnership. Now, Pride finally got sold, and in a way, there was a happy outcome. We made a 40%, 46% return on owning the company during that period of time, which was acceptable. It was not great, but we can live with it. No, if you compare that to Seadrill, the numbers look very, very different. They started out at a very similar valuation, price book around two, but during this period, including the dividends, Seadrill returned 456%. And I think that's a pretty good but extreme example of the difference between a good and bad management, even in a highly commoditized industry. Now, the last thing I want to talk about is dividends. And, you know, I'm the first one to admit that dividends can be pretty boring in the sense that, you know, when markets move up and down by 4% in a week, it's kind of boring to look at the dividend and realize you only get that amount of money once a year. But that's also why dividends have this deceptive feature that a lot of people forget to think about it. From my point of view, that's extremely dangerous. And there is a reasonably good academic backing for saying that. If you look at long-term returns, and this is US data, so the S&P going back from 1926 and up until today, you will notice the following. And that is that half of the return, more or less half the return you got out of American equities came to you through dividend. Then another large chunk came through earnings growth and a little bit came through changes in the multiples. Now, we're pretty simple people. So if we realize by picking stocks that pay us a healthy dividend, we can get halfway to beating the market just when we start the race, we think that's a pretty good value proposition. And that's why we think of dividends as our friends and very important friends in delivering healthy returns to our unit holders. There are also a couple of other interesting features with dividend that you want to keep in mind. And that is that companies that pay dividends tell you something about how they think about their shareholders. They think about their shareholders as partners. The other thing is that dividends is a good indication that the company has a predictable future, i.e. it has enough visibility on its future earnings to be able to share some of it with its shareholders. And it also generates sufficient cash to both grow the business and give something back to those who back them with the money in the first place. Now, where does this fit into the modern financial markets? I think it's fair to say that the markets develop all the time, and I think it's reasonable to say that markets get more clever all the time, i.e., the, if you look at the individual participants in the market today, each individual analyst and all the people analyzing stocks today as opposed to 50 years ago, you'd probably say that on average they're a bit, more, a bit smarter, they have a bit more education, and they are a bit more sophisticated. You know, they have the computers to do their calculations and so on. The big paradox, though, is that the collective short-termism and irrationality of the market seem to be increasing. You can just witness what we've seen in the last 10 years with the financial crisis and the dot-com bubble. It doesn't look like what I just said, that the people actually making the individual decisions have gotten an awful lot more clever. So what does that mean for value investors? Well, let's begin with a bit, the be, a bit of bad news, and that is that from an the, the, the typically optically cheap stocks, i.e. the stocks that on the surface looks really cheap, i.e. an extremely low multiple, an extremely low price to book, they are increasingly cheap for a reason. Because today there are a lot of computer models, a lot of global asset managers screening the world for these type of assets. And, if the, and mispricings do get picked up more quickly today than they did 20 years ago. That goes for any asset class in the world. Now, that's the bad news, but I still think there is a few bit, bits of good news as well. And I think if you have to weigh the two against each other, I think the two at the bottom outweighs the one on the top. 
The first one is that pricing between sectors have gotten very homogeneous in many instances. So when a sector goes into fashion, everyone piles in, the share prices all go up together because you, you know what analysts do is they compare one against the other. And if one's expensive, then the next one should be even more expensive because they think it's slightly better or whatnot. And that works the other way around. So increasingly you see with ETF trading and so on, that and thematic investing, that sectors go in and out of favor and people either are all excited about it or they leave very, very quickly. Now, you see the same thing. Um, the other th and the other thing you see is that I think, honestly, that there is an increased level of short-termism in the market. And if you look at the studies that try to explain this academically, you will find that the ho average holding period for shares today has decreased quite consistently for a very long time. I think it's down to now only a couple of months. And, what's the, and, and the other thing that you see as a consequence of that and partly interrelated is increased collective irrationality. The reason for that is number one, that we have an awful lot of hedge funds. And I have a great deal of respect for hedge funds. I think they employ some really clever people doing some very interesting thing. Now the problem is that hedge funds are typically pretty short term minded. And these are the guys that pay 50% of the commission that goes to Wall Street. And they're pretty vocal about that fact. So they tell the analysts that they should start making analysis that support their short term view of the world. And as such, the analyst community and the marketing community and the media community all tend to get sucked into the hedge funds short term way of thinking. And that's the stuff that we tend to get in our mail box every day from these analysts. The other thing, and these things you know, we've seen in playing out now a couple of times in the markets, is that there is a lot of complexity, a lot of leverage in the system. We don't know where it is, it moves around, and that causes things sometimes to drop off very quickly when it falls out of favor or someone has to delever their positions. Now, in this context, I venture to say that our investment philosophy remains reasonably relevant. And why do I say that? Well, number one, because I think being, having a value investing foundation, i.e. being able to trace our origins back to Graham and Dodd, is still the best place you can trace your origin as an investor. Now, another thing where I think we've gotten better over time is that we've gotten more experienced. We've been, Skagen has been doing global equities now for close to 20 years. And I think when you've done something for that long a period, you learn things as you go along that you can then replicate and use one more time. Samsung taught us a lot of things about Korea. So when Hyundai Motors got extremely cheap, we could apply that knowledge and also make a lot of money, money buying Hyundai during the financial crisis. And it's a bit the same with how what we learned about John Fredrickson's frontline allowed us to also invest in his C-drill. Now, we can also continue to be extremely research driven, but I think our focus when we're research driven is that we think more long term and we try to be very fundamental. We don't spend any time on macro on the things we don't understand. Instead, we try to get a bit better about what we do understand. And that's how companies operate, how we should value them and how they indeed do their value creation. Now, there are two things that I think have become increasingly important and increasingly uh, how should I put it, have increasingly become our edge in the market where we operate. And that's independence, i.e. we're independent, no one really tells us what to do, we sit far away from the global financial markets, and our decision processes are independent. We don't have committees, we don't have consensus, good ideas are good ideas, and we put our money where we think we have the good ideas. And I've, if I if I'm going to be completely honest here, I think it's absolutely wonderful to live in Stavanger, despite the 220 days of rain, because I'm far away from everyone else. I can use my own mind without other people trying to use their mind to convince me what to do. The last thing that I think is incredibly important these days is long term. As I just described, the markets have become increasingly short term and by being long term in our thinking and also being in the very fortunate position of having unit holders, i.e. investors in our fund that are long term and do understand what we're trying to do, we're able to put on our three to five year glasses when we look at, at investments instead of worrying, oh, is this going to pay off over the next quarter? So when I think about the uh, animal spirits of Mr. Schiller, 
And uh, when, when you put together the animal spirits of Mr. Schiller and the Vietnamese family of Rosling, I think it's fair to say that the market will probably continue to be irrational and that there will be people in this world, there will be parts of this world that will continue to grow and allow, allow companies to continue to grow their value, i.e. create value for shareholders. With those two elements in place, I think we're in a pretty good position. Then it's really up to, for up, to, up to us to apply our framework with a little bit of common sense and these other things I spoke about today in our kitchen and use that to hopefully also produce some reasonably healthy returns in the future. Thank you very much. Thank you, Tokel, for an inspiring speech. Uh, anyone putting up an, uh, an arm for Tokel? There are a lot of people down here also trying to make money in the market every day, wondering how to do it most efficiently. Well, then I'll put the first one. Um, there is an author, a lot of people like to quote, he writes a book like Black Swan. Yes. Uh, he's called Taleb. Yes. Uh, we could have invited him here, but we checked on the video and, and he talked a lot. So when you ask him a simple question, he talks 10 minutes, goes into 12 different subjects, and finally we could see on YouTube 10 Russian guys in the panel trying to suffocate him because he was being very boring. So he'll stay home, but his insight is any rule in the financial market that makes money will eventually kill itself. Yes. Because a lot of people would do it. And you present value investing going back to 34, and still we can make a little extra money instead of doing growth. Why, why is that, you think? Well, I think you know, there's, there's two elements to this. The first thing is that you have to keep in mind that value investing has also evolved with time. And I mean, if you look at what Buffett put into his portfolio in the 50s compared to what he owns today, being able to take Graham's legacy and apply it in a slightly changing environment is what makes value investing still work for a lot of dedicated investors today. The other thing is animal spirits. Value investing is one of the most difficult uh, ways to invest in the real world because sometimes you have to go against the crowds. You have to be convinced on your own facts and don't listen to what other people tell you. And that's extremely hard. And I think it's fair to say that I don't think people have gotten any better at doing that today than they were 50 years ago. That's why we still have bubbles. Right. Um, finally, last question. Uh, the fund's performance on three and five years horizon going back looks yes. fine, and you have five stars. But last time you underperformed the index, which you don't follow closely, by one and a half percentage points. Yes. So what made 2011 a little difficult for you, and how do you see into 2012 in the global fund? Well, I think, uh, you know, and, and, and I, I'll, I'll just say right away that we hate losing money more than anyone in this room, and we hate, and we're competitive people, so we, even though we don't care about the index, we hate to lose against it. So, but I, I think if you look at 2011, there is a silver lining. And, and, and what I like, when I look at the fundamentals of the companies in our portfolio, I would venture to say that they kept on creating value for us as owners. So when we look at 2011, there weren't a lot of instances where we experienced a permanent loss of capital. I think it was more a situation where the market, which the market does a lot, a lot of the time, disagreed with us in the way we view the world. And that is exactly what makes me feel pretty good about 2012. If our companies can continue to create value like they did in 2011 going into next year, we'll be okay. And you know, typically, it only takes you know, a little bit of time before the market catches up with what we're seeing. And, and that's what makes me pretty optimistic about 2012. A bit more of our type of perspective on what's value creation would take us to a very good spot this year. Thank you, Tokel. Aida. Mm -hmm.